Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation. I'll be presenting on vibrosis, understanding the burden of disease and methods for early detection. So, what is vibrosis? It is actually a non-cholera illness caused by vibrio species. It can occur in both humans and aquatic animals. Vibrosis is actually quite often underreported as healthy individuals are usually at a low risk of getting infected. However, in individuals who are high risk, there is a lack of awareness of the potentials of vibrio infections. Let's have a look at the star of the show today, the vibrios. They are gram-negative, rod-shaped bacteria and there are over a hundred species of vibrios that exist in our ecosystem. They are autochthonous inhabitants of aquatic environments and they prefer to reside in warm, brackish waters. For this presentation, we will be focusing on Vibrio parahemolyticus, Vibrio bonificus, and non 01 non 0139 Vibrio cholerae, as these are the most common pathogens for vibrosis in humans. Speaking of Vibrio infections, you might be wondering what are the types of illnesses they can cause. Here, we have a healthy individual. When he's infected with Vibrios, he could present with different symptoms and diseases. For instance, they could develop gastroenteritis, where the symptoms are nausea, vomiting, fever, and fatigue. This is commonly caused by Vibrio parahemolyticus and non-01, non-0139 Vibrio cholerae. If the individual has a wound and the wound is exposed to Vibrio species, they could develop a wound infection which can lead to satellitis or necrotizing fasciitis. Vibrio vulnificus is the most common vibrio species to cause wound infections. In severe cases, the infected individual may require hospitalization or even limb amputation. The infected individual could also develop septicemia if the wound infection is not treated in time. This can result in multi-organ failure and ultimately death. Thus, it is very important to understand the ways Vibrios can be transmitted to us and the risk factors so that we can protect ourselves from these pathogens. How are these Vibrio species transmitted to us? When we consume inadequately cooked seafood or when we consume water or food that has been contaminated with Vibrios, we risk getting infected and develop gastroenteritis. In addition, if we have existing wounds on our bodies, exposure of our wounds to contaminated waters could potentially make way for vibrios to infect us. An example would be participating in recreational activities involving water bodies, and also people whose occupations require them to be exposed to open water bodies, such as fishermen, are also at risk of getting vibrio infections. Now that we know how vibrios can be transmitted to humans, let's dwell into the risk factors of vibrosis. The risk factors include the elderly and the immunocompromised, such as those who are taking immunosuppressants or have autoimmune diseases. Individuals with pre-existing comorbidities, such as heart disease, liver disease, renal disease, and etc., are at a higher risk of getting infected. As I've mentioned, the people who have occupations that require them to be exposed to water bodies or those participating in water-related recreational activities are also at risk of developing vibrosis. Lastly, we have the raw seafood consumers and handlers of seafood who are also at risk. Vibrosis or vibrio infections or vibrio outbreaks have long been reported worldwide. Here are some of the examples of recent reports of vibrio infections involving vibrio parahemolyticus, vibrio vulnificus, and non-01, non-01 39 vibrio cholerae. Gastroenteritis and wound infections are often reported. With regards to gastroenteritis, we do see a lot of reports on vibrio parahemolyticus being the causative agent, and the reports often involve the consumption of seafood contaminated with vibrio parahemolyticus, which ultimately resulted in the foodborne outbreak. This is why it is always important to ensure the seafood being consumed is fully cooked or of legally approved standards to reduce the risk of getting vibrio infections. Case reports related to vibrio vulnificus wound infections often involve a patient 
that has other comorbidities or is immunocompromised. Some reports also show a quick deterioration of the patient's health once they are infected. They are often hospitalized and require extensive antibiotic therapy, with some cases going as far as to having their limbs amputated. Moreover, the case fatality rates for Vibrio vomificus is relatively high. In summary, all of these aforementioned Vibrio species can cause disease in humans with Vibrio vomificus infections having a high fatality rate. Now, we all know that prevention is better than cure. Therefore, the early detection of these pathogenic Vibrio species could help us prevent outbreaks and infections can be better managed at an earlier stage. This brings us to the next part of my presentation, which is the various rapid detection methods of Vibrio species. We have nucleic acid-based methods, immunological-based methods, and biosensors. I will be giving some brief examples for each category of rapid detection methods. For nucleic acid-based methods, we have the very commonly known polymerase chain reactions. Some examples of the PCR are multiplex PCR and real-time PCR. Say you want to detect if your sample has a specific Vibro species in it. First, you need your sample. Then, you will have to extract the DNA from the sample and prepare the DNA with PCR mix with the relevant primers that are specific to the species you wish to detect. Then, you just place them into the thermal cycler set at the required settings. Then, the thermal cycler will carry out the amplification process. For multiplex PCR or simple PCR, you will retrieve your PCR products and run gel electrophoresis with it, and upon viewing the results, you will know if your sample contains the Vibrio species or not. As for real-time PCR, you can skip this step as the results will be shown in real-time. Moving on to loop-mediated isothermal amplification, or LAMP for short, LAMP is based on the principle of autocycling strand displacement DNA synthesis. The process utilizes BST DNA and a set of four specially designed primers. The initial steps are the same, where we get the samples and we extract the DNA. Then, LAMP occurs continuously under isothermal conditions at about 60 to 65 degrees Celsius. After amplification, Amplicons of many different sizes of stem loop DNAs are generated with cauliflower-like structures with multiple loops. To detect a positive sample, you just have to look out for a white precipitate made up of magnesium pyrophosphate. Next up is the microarray. The initial steps are still the same when we extract the DNA from the sample. Restriction endonucleases are used to cut the unknown DNA from our sample into fragments, and these fragments are labeled with fluorescence markers. Then, these fragmented DNA will hybridize with the immobilized probes that are deposited on the DNA chip. The remaining DNA fragments are washed away. The microarray scanner will then collect the fluorescence pattern and the results will be displayed as such. The target DNA can then be easily visualized and identified. For the second category, we have immunological-based methods which will cover enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, ELISA, and lateral flow immunoassays. ELISA has been widely used to detect microorganisms and it works based on a specific antigen-antibody reaction. In this case, using Vibrio toxins is an example of an antigen. The antigen binds to the antibody immobilized on the microtiter plate. Then, the antigen reacts with a specific antibody which is recognized by an enzyme-labeled secondary antibody. If there is a presence of the antigen or Vibrio toxins, development of color can be observed. For lateral flow immunoassays, it is able to identify Vibrio species by the conjugation of Vibrio toxins or Vibrio membrane proteins with monoclonal antibodies. This immunoassay depends on the accumulation of colored reagents at a test and or control line to produce visible results. Lateral flow immunoassays can be in the form of dipsticks or immunochromatographic strips. In simple terms, you place your sample on one end and the antigens in your sample will bind to the conjugated antibodies, and then they will bind to the monoclonal antibodies on the test line. Positive samples can be identified by the observation of a colored line on both test and control line.
here we have two examples of biosensors. Surface plasma resonance biosensor is an optical biosensor. It is made up of a bioreceptor with an optical transducer system. How it works is that the outer membrane proteins or vibrios will bind to the bioreceptors that are immobilized on the surface of a thin metal film. This binding will cause a shift in the resonance produced by the electromagnetic radiation of a specific wavelength and the electron cloud of the thin metal. The shift will determine the concentration of bound pathogens. Next, we have the turn-on type FRET APTA sensor. FRET APTA sensors use fluorescent substances as signal sources that exhibit high signal intensity that can easily label aphthers. Researchers developed this turn-on type FRET APTA sensor by using an aphthermal probe as the fluorescent source and another crunch probe. The aphthermal used has a high affinity towards the target vibrios where positive samples will emit fluorescence. As research is constantly ongoing and progressing, there have been advancements in rapid detection methods. For instance, a group of researchers developed spot dye based sensors for the rapid detection of vibrio species in water samples. How it works is actually very simple. First, you have your water sample, and you culture the sample in a selective growth medium which promotes the growth of vibrios. The dye based sensor is then added into the sample, and positive samples will turn red or pink. The dye comprises of tetrazolium dye and the carbon source to detect live bacteria. Last but not least, CRISPR-Cas systems have also been studied to be applied in the rapid detection of vibrio species. In this example, the DNA is extracted from the sample and a polymerase chain reaction is done with the presence of CRISPR reagent followed by centrifugation. What happens is, the specific cRNA which targets the amplification sequence undergoes maturation which is facilitated by the Cas12A enzyme. This process will lead to the breakage of the double channel DNA and the cRNA will now bind to the target DNA. Then, the Cas12A enzyme will cleave the single channel DNA producing the targeted amplicons. These amplicons can be better visualized by using fluorophore quencher FQ labeled reporters. These FQ labeled reporters will be cleaved by the Cas 12A enzyme, producing an obvious green fluorescence. In conclusion, there are various rapid detection methods available to detect vibrio species at high sensitivity and specificity. Each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. When deciding on which method to use, you may want to consider multiple factors such as your sample size, target species, and the resources available to you. All in all, these rapid detection methods will allow us to detect vibrios at an early stage to prevent outbreaks and to maintain public health. That concludes my presentation and thank you for listening. Hope you have a good one.